so just to introduce myself as the chair, I'm Peter Nair, I'm the co-chair of Campbell uh, Crime and Justice, uh, and I'm going to be trying to get this presentation to work. Uh, so first off, what we thought we would do is start with a, an introduction from the two of the programme uh, and the commissioners of the programme uh, from uh, the Department of Homeland Security and from Public Safety Canada, and then lead into us into a series of uh, presentations that, that bring out of a, a of what is a, now a three year programme uh, for systematic reviews on preventing uh, radicalisation and violence. Um, and so we're on a we, we've we've already we've got a, quite a number of people in flight and more to so without further ado, which I, I don't know which whether Ajmal or Jihan, whether you want which one of you want to go first, uh, but Ajmal, I get you to go just to give an overview of the program and and the, what we're trying to achieve here. Sure thing, Peter. Um, good day, everybody. So my name is Ajmal Aziz. <clears throat> I'm a program manager at the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate. Um, you know, Peter kind of alluded to how this is a, a three year program of records. So you know, I'm not going to talk to uh, you know, terrorism and violent extremism and kind of the global threats those face. But, um, you know, we identified a few years ago the need to really tap into what our uh, Five Eyes, Five RD partners are doing in terms of better understanding, um, you know, terrorism and violent extremism, the efficacy and impact of, uh, you know, allied responses so that, you know, we have a better way of um, informing our respective operational and policy communities um, responsible for public well-being. Um, so back in 2018, uh, the Department of Homeland Security with our partners over at Public Safety Canada, in addition to some of our other um, uh, uh, you know, public safety and security entities of Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, kind of convened this five research and development uh, community with the goal of um, really sharing, um, you know, uh, work that we're doing, uh, you know, being able to kind of leverage, uh, you know, uh, ongoing uh, research uh, with the goal of really disseminating, uh, you know, uh, applied research to deliver new knowledge and capabilities. Um, you know, during this task, uh, we started working with Peter and the Campbell collaboration because we identified uh, a glaring need where it was important for us um, to really get a better understanding as to what the state of science looked like for prevention programming. So we were able to work with the 5RD to identify and prioritize um, many topics uh, that Campbell would then be uh, undertaking to just give us some better understanding as to what the state of evidence looks like for uh, prevention programming. Um, Jihan, I'm gonna pass it to you because I've got a uh, young toddler screaming right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we have to remember it's very early in the morning. So, Jihan, over to you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, this is good now, right? <laughs> so, hi, everyone. Good morning from Montreal, Canada. Welcome to What Works Global Summit and this special plenary on countering violent extremism. I'm Jihan Rabah, Research Advisor at the Canada Centre for Community Engagement and Prevention of Violence. The Canada Center guides the government of Canada's approach to preventing and countering radicalization to violence. We take a multi-sectoral, interdisciplinary, evidence-based approach to this work that complements but remains distinct from criminal justice or national security efforts, with our work also informed by other fields such as crime prevention, public health, community safety, well-being, and social work. We're designed to be a national center of excellence helping the field grow and develop better shaped guidelines and standards, but also recognize that the local is crucial, both in terms of different needs for prevention, as well as different strengths to harness. This approach to prevention means that in addition to supporting prevention and intervention initiatives, the Canada Center works towards enhancing research capacity to better design and implement effective, evidence-based and ethical approaches and policies to CRV tailored to local context. Investments in research projects, some of which we will hear from today, are crucial to help us professionalize the field and expand evidence-based capacity in CRV. 
When we speak about professionalizing the practice, it's in recognition that preventing and countering violent extremism remains a relatively young field of prevention, seeking new and more evidence-based methods, approaches, and tools to support and guide the work of frontline practitioners and policymakers. One tool that has been gaining importance for the growth of this field is the systematic evidence reviews. So these reviews help us synthesize and evaluate existing research as well as draw from adjacent and complementary fields to find best practices. The Canada Centre has become a strong supporter of Canberra reviews as we see the potential and now a growing record of success in leveraging collective intelligence to help us advance in the field of preventing and building resilience against violent extremism. The strength of Campbell's systematic reviews includes strong emphasis on focusing questions on policy and practitioner needs, the comprehensive search for evidence, the criterion-based selection of relevant evidence, the rigorous appraisal of validity, objective summary, and other empirical inferences. I think I'm going to stop here. Of course, no approach comes without its challenges. While the classic Campbell approach strongly favors translating proper usage of the research outputs and, and to plain summaries in order to reach wider audiences, there are still challenges in connecting evidence about what works in general to the practical evidence needs of frontline practitioners. As such, we collectively have more work to do to help ensure proper usage of the research outputs, including to help inform how to adapt general prevention models to fit local context. So to say the least, there is still a lot of work for us to do, and I'm looking forward to it. Today, you will be hearing of several projects, some of which are founded collaboratively by the Canada Centre and Defence Research and Development Canada, the Centre for Security Science. And Dr. Marsden and Dr. Lewis will be presenting on their ongoing review that examines progress and outcome measurement tools for case management interventions in the context of countering radicalization to violence and related fields of harm prevention. In addition, I think we also have Dr. Raida Hassan from UCAM, Université du Québec à Montréal, who is also the founder and director of the Canadian Practitioners Network on Prevention of Radicalization and Extremist Violence, who will be presenting on her review, on her current review on the evidence of the associations and impacts of hate online and in traditional media on individuals, audiences, and communities. Now, I wish all of us an insightful and fruitful discussion and I would like to thank all speakers and organizers for their great effort in preparing this event. Thank you so much. Peter, over to you. Into the questions themselves, uh, just a, a kind of bit of an overview as well on the process that we've adopted uh, between uh, the 5RD partners and Campbell. So. We've got, we have a, an advisory group, uh, but drawn both from 5RD partners, and we brought in academics and uh, practitioner experts from around the world. Uh, we, 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 we chart, we're trying to get this rolling program to work with picking the, the hot topics, uh, the key topics for policy from each of the 5RD partners, um, and then mould those into effective Campbell reviews. I have to say this is not without its challenges. These the, the questions the questions are challenging and some of the reviews have been extremely challenging and large. Uh, and we're only going to cover a small number of them today. Uh, we're hoping to cover a lot more of them at, at the Stockholm Symposium in June next year. So there's another opportunity to come back to this and hopefully with a with a with a with a, 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 another wider audience and cover try to cover the 18 reviews that this program is already in the process of delivering. So I'm going to start with the reviews that are in flight uh, before we move to the reviews that uh, that are complete and in the process of either published or in the process of being uh, published. So I'm going to start with uh, with James, if I may. James, Sarah, over to you. Thanks very much, my, uh, Peter, and thanks for the opportunity to come and talk to you about the work that we've been doing and to Public Safety Canada and DHS for, for their support for this work as well. Uh, important to say right at the start that it's uh, James and I are sort of presenting today, but our review also benefits from contributions from collaborators, including Adrian Cherney at the University of Queensland, Martina Zuthan from the Royal United Services Institute and a team from Hedaya, as well as a much 
bigger team at St Andrews who are also helping us. So we're fronting it today, but there is a big team uh, project as well. So our review looks at the effectiveness of tools and approach, approaches used in case management interventions seeking to counter radicalisation to violence. So that's quite a mouthful. Um, and Jihan also helpfully introduced that for us. To put it another way, one of the most commonly asked questions in the context of programmes to counter radicalisation or CVE interventions is what works to reduce the risk of radicalisation? Our review asks a sort of a variation on that question and it, because it wants to understand how interventions work, not just whether they do. So we're sort of perhaps less interested in whether specific interventions like ideological support or mentoring are effective. And we're more concerned with understanding whether it matters how those interventions are delivered. So we are still working on our review. As Peter said, it is still in flight. Uh, so we don't have the final fi findings to share with you. Instead, we wanted to explain a bit about how we've approached the puzzle of understanding whether tools and approaches that sit around CV interventions matter, because we think there are some really important insights that are made possible by thinking about that broader context. And we'll also share some preliminary findings about how we think interventions shape outcomes in the context of CV programmes. So to understand whether the process by which interventions are delivered matters, we've had to do some work to conceptualise what happens around an intervention. And to help with that, we've looked beyond the field of terrorism and extremism to draw on a broader framework, which was originally developed in social work, known as case management and that kind of like foregrounds and frames our review. For those that don't know, case management's a model for tailoring interventions to individual cases. And it's made up of a number of stages that cover the process by which people are first identified as being in need of support, um, providing means of assessing their needs and their vulnerabilities. It includes approaches to developing case intervention plans, as well as mechanisms to manage the way interventions are delivered and the measures used to understand and support their exit out of the programme. And we think that's a really useful approach for two reasons. So first of all, identifying those key stages in the intervention process and the tools that are used at each of those stages helps to organise what's a pretty fragmented and uneven evidence base. So, for example, quite a bit of attention has now been paid to risk assessment processes, but far less has been paid to case planning. And there's really very little effort to try and sort of integrate evidence across different stages of the case management process. So we're hoping that by taking that more holistic approach that can help us organise the research across the process that sits around CV interventions. And in that way, that can help us identify the strengths and weaknesses of the evidence base, but also create a more robust foundation for practice because that broader case management process involves very often coordinating multi-agency processes that are characteristic of CVE programming. And the second reason we think it's useful is because it addresses the challenge that the logic underpinning interventions or the relationships between a programme's activities and its outcomes is often left unstated. And we think that by mapping those processes out, it makes the assumptions, so for instance, around how risk assessment processes shape case planning, more explicit. And that can then help um, in both developing but also delivering tailored intervention plans. But we want to go further than that. As well as analysing those more specific tools that are used across the case management process, we want to take the question of how interventions work one step further to try and understand um, whether it matters the broader approach through which interventions are delivered. So do approaches make a difference? So, for example, and in you know, very, very broad terms, whether an intervention takes a security oriented or a punitive approach or whether it has a more supportive rehabilitative logic. So to understand the kind of approach that interventions take, we've again drawn from a wider body of research, this time from criminology. And that research has identified two broad models of working with offenders and those at risk, risk-based approaches and strengths-based approaches. I'm going to do a huge um, injustice to what are very significant bodies of research and practice, um, but for the purposes of, of today, hopefully just sketching out what those mean gives a sense of how we want to try and understand this notion of how interventions approach working with vulnerable people. So risk-based approaches originated really in the what works to reduce reoffending agenda, and it's heavily oriented towards managing and reducing risk. 
And the best known model of that is the risk needs responsivity model, which really aims to try and take an evidence based approach to first match the level of support an individual receives to the degree of risk they're believed to pose. So that's the risk principle. And then directing interventions at dynamic risk factors, which are believed to be linked to offending, the need principle. And then matching the intervention with the individual's characteristics, so the responsivity principle. By contrast, strengths based approaches focus on developing skills and strengths. So that is a very broad term, um, which refers to sort of positive internal or external characteristics, either of someone themselves or the environment that they live in. And this approach argues that instead of heavily focusing on managing risk, the emphasis should be on developing strengths that are believed to contribute to positive outcomes. So it goes beyond understanding what works to reduce reoffending, but also to understand what helps to support desistance or the move away from crime. And in our case, of course, violent extremism. So our work so far suggests that both of those approaches are reflected in research and practice with terrorism offenders. And to give a flavor of that research and the research that we've been identifying through the review process, I'm gonna pass on to James now, who's going to talk briefly through two findings that we think are worth drawing attention to at this stage, both because they focus on the tools that are used, but also those broader approaches. So over to James. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. So. The two findings I'm going to talk about may not be too surprising and are likely to be relevant to interventions operating in a range of different policy areas, but they reflect particular challenges that those working in CVE interventions face. So the first finding helps to illustrate how the ways in which individual components of interventions and any associated tools are delivered can influence intervention outcomes. And that relates to the finding that effective multi-agency working is a crucial component of intervention effectiveness. So most of the interventions we've reviewed so far take a multi-agency approach when identifying and assessing clients and when designing and delivering tailored intervention plans. Now in theory, multi-agency approaches are well suited to this space as different forms of expertise are needed to identify and to address the range of different factors that are likely to be relevant to understanding and tackling individual cases of radicalization. However, it's important to examine how those working arrangements play out in practice and our preliminary analysis finds a number of potential challenges here, most notably practical issues relating to information sharing, for example, as well as potential power imbalances between different partners. So a key avenue of our analysis will be examining whether and how different approaches to multi-agency working might influence intervention outcomes, whether positively or negatively. The second finding you wanted to highlight relates to how a particular approach might shape outcomes through the process by which the intervention is delivered. And that relates to the finding that positive change is more likely when clients are motivated to engage with the intervention process. So because violent extremists typically reject the legitimacy of state actors, including those who might deliver interventions, Motivating clients to engage with state funded programs is a particular challenge. And so understanding what helps support that process is especially important. And a consistent theme across a number of the interventions that we see as producing promising results is their emphasis on fostering the motivation of their clients. So fostering client motivation is likely to be a key element of many interventions, regardless of whether they're underpinned by strength based or a risk oriented logic, or in some combination, in some instances, sorry, a combination of the two. However, there is some preliminary evidence to suggest that interventions underpinned by a strength-based approach, which by definition rely on clients taking ownership of their journey away from violent extremism, have the potential to be particularly effective in motivating clients to engage in the process. The intervention providers in turn will attempt to foster motivation during early interactions with clients, whether by using particular techniques such as motivational interviewing or by building therapeutic relationships with their clients through less formal, sometimes unstructured engagement. But it's worth noting that whilst these techniques appear to be promising, motivating clients in this space is likely to remain challenging, as the particular nature of terrorist offending means that intervention clients will often be placed under strict restrictions that can themselves be demotivating. So to some extent, then, security-oriented logics are embedded in all interventions, including those that are underpinned by strength-based approaches. And that means that intervention providers need to find an appropriate balance between these different logics, which is inherently difficult. So whilst our analysis of both these themes is still very preliminary, hopefully this, that brief overview highlights how particular tools and approaches might contribute to positive intervention outcomes but, and the challenges that might undermine the implementation of case management tools and approaches 
and ultimately why we think exploring implementation matters. And with that, I'll pass back to Sarah for a, for a brief conclusion. Thanks, James. So our next steps then um, are to complete the review of the studies that we found and integrate those across different stages of the case management process. And um, that's a challenging process because not least we're looking across a range of different languages. So Russian, French, uh, Scandinavian languages and German. But hopefully when we've done that, we'll be able to synthesise that evidence that relates to the effectiveness of tools and approaches. And in doing that, provide a more holistic overview of how the different phases of case management processes operate and also to try and make the assumptions that underpin counter radicalization interventions more explicit and examine also the validity of those assumptions. And as uh, part of the review, we're also looking at transferable lessons from case management tools and approaches used in broader fields of um, violence prevention and hopefully sort of importing those insights and holding them against what we know around CVE programmes. So hopefully if we're given the opportunity to come back or go to Stockholm next year, um, then we'll be able to share the findings of the study with you then. But hopefully that's given a sense of what we're trying to do and how we think it might be helpful to practice. Thanks. Thanks both. Uh, that, um, for those that are listening um, and are listening to the recorded version of this, um, if you're in any doubt about the fact that the Campbell model for systematic reviewing is being stretched and being pushed in order to, prov to provide the answers to these questions, uh, then I think that was a pretty good introduction to the way in which we've tried to, to step up and meet the challenge. So I thank you both for that. That was uh, encouraging. And um, I'd love to see the uh, the finale in uh, in Stockholm. So let's move on now to Haida San, who should be on. Uh, yes. Who should be, who's on the call. Yep. I'm here. Uh, can and, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Over to you. Great, thank you. Good morning from Montreal, everyone. So um, like Sarah and James, I will actually bring you another kind of result, which is more related to the process uh, challenges. And I think Peter's transition was really <laughs> excellent in those regards. Uh, from a practitioner perspective, really, the, the, um, the interest, especially in, in such a new field like preventing extremism, the main interest in systematic reviews is uh, for us uh, researchers and practitioners to provide the practice field with evidence they can trust and with evidence that is translatable and transferable, if I can say, uh, to their day-to-day -day practices. And this has been a challenge in the field of extremism because many of the programs, many of the risk assessment tools as well that exist out there um, have in a way been uh, kind of built uh, on the ground related to research funded, but really with, I can say, not so much research about the, uh, the impacts, the effectiveness, the outcomes um, of these different, whether prevention, intervention, or risk assessment tools. Um, and the interest in conducting research and evidence reviews is really that it provides us both evidence from and back for the field. So this, in a way, this dynamic was the main um, objective to be achieved uh, in doing systematic reviews. At CPN, we, we, we're working with, with the um, um, help of Campbell collaboration to actually two reviews, the protocols of the reviews are, are published and you can find them on, on the website. So the first one is really on hate online and in traditional media. And it is a review of evidence on the impact of hate online on individuals, audiences and communities. <laughs> and the second is on uh, risk assessment tools. So we're looking whether risk assessment tools actually fit the purpose meaning uh, measuring, assessing risk of violent acting out in the extremism and violent radicalization field. In the uh, process of conducting the systematic reviews, um, we were faced with uh, several important challenges. And I think these are a need to be considered as results <laughs> um, because they have strong methodological importance, but also a, a, a process importance in conducting 
systematic reviews, and most importantly, in making systematic reviews meaningful for the practitioner community. Um, I will, there are many challenges. I will talk about five challenges um, and give five examples of these challenges and then uh, discuss how we try to, to address in a way those challenges. Um, the first and most important uh, challenge in the field is the terms and definitions. So unlike, uh, you know, medical fields, for example, even in medical fields, but particularly in the field of violent radicalization and extremism, how you define risk, um, how you differentiate, for example, risk from threat, how you define hate is in and by itself a tremendous challenge, uh, not only because it is defined differently across geographical areas or even across disciplines in the same geographical areas, but even because the wordings that are used to describe the phenomenon is, are different in different geographical areas. So the biggest challenge is really how to overcome those uh, disciplinary and geographical and even linguistic, if I may say, challenges, um, which starts by making choices and making choices introduces definitely a form of bias. That does not invalidate the process. I think it just makes us realize that um, it is, um, how to say, uh, located in a specific number of disciplinary fields or geographic fields. And so the idea then is to go through those different definitions, find what's common, adapt, the language, adapt the wording, adapt the definitions for every single um, search. So this relates to the search strategy, uh, publication location bias, keywords, different languages. I can simply mention that in some areas of the world, um, there are no words relating to extremism used in the field of extremism. And so we need to go from like, let's say, uh, local perspective and try to understand actually what are the wordings that are generally used and how we can change and define those those uh, key term searchers and those search strategies so again peter spoke about the flexibility um, it's almost an iterative process <laughs> like in a qualitative qualitative study so a lot of back and forth a lot of reflection uh, thinking about the search strategies about the keywords testing piloting and retesting, um, which, I mean, and, and I, I really wanted to focus on, on this aspect today um, and hopefully, yes, present the results um, of, the, of the reviews at a later stage because the method is central. And if we don't speak about those challenges and the creative solutions to finding those challenges, um, that may be a major challenge in understanding uh, what is valid and use and useful in the in the outcomes in the final results of the systematic reviews. Um, the third challenge is the type and the state of the existing literature. So, in the field of extremism, most studies are cross sectional, correlational. So, when you use wording such as the impact of hate on individuals and communities, how are we really going to assess impact when we're talking about a state of literature that is in and by itself very limited, but also that has a second sub challenge, which is the big amount of qualitative literature in the field, um, almost equivalent, if not more than quantitative literature in the field. But then how do you combine in a valid and reliable way, quantitative and qualitative literature. And this has been a major challenge. And, and we, we, we try to find ways around it. We try to, to, to discuss it. And for both reviews, the final decision that, that we made was to focus on quantitative literature, but to inform uh, the results obtained by the meta uh, by the you know by the the the, the meta analysis and and the and the quantitative literature by the existing qualitative literature so in a way the qualitative literature is going to provide 
the nuances, the context um, that are essential to understanding the quantitative literature, particularly for practitioners in the field who basically, and I'm a practitioner in the field, we work, all our work is about nuances. <laughs> all our work is about exceptions to the rules. So uh, in terms of trajectories, for example, in terms of impacts, in terms of how people experience impacts and how they uh, react to those impacts and, and the idea of exposure, how they react to the exposure of online hate, for example, or how even uh, risk tools assessment work with certain individuals, certain populations and not other populations based on gender, based on age, based on cultural uh, origin, for example. And so the qualitative literature is really essential to provide that context and those nuances. And finally, how do we make those results interpretable for practitioners? If uh, the issue is that if review standards are too restrictive, conclusions may become meaningless for practitioners and of little use because they become very general. And I will refer quickly to Douglas Adams in one of his books who said, research is the process of slowly, expensively, and painfully discovering the surprisingly obvious. So we do not want that in our systematic reviews. We do not want those standards to be too restrictive. And this meant quite a bit of work with, with the Campbell collaboration in order to instill flexibility in the methods in order to be able to do robust work, but also capture the complexity, capture those, those nuances that have the important implications for practice. So we're working hard, I think, in, in publishing the protocols we have successfully managed to uh, resolve <laughs> those challenges. And I'm very eager to be able to present the final results of the, of the systematic reviews. But I think one of the results is the success in addressing those challenges as well. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, again, that's another one I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing uh, and indeed seeing as well as a, as a co-chair. Um, the kind of general lessons, one of the general lessons we've, uh, we've, we've been very clear to learn through this particular set of reviews, uh, which is the largest uh, set of funded reviews we've ever tried to do uh, and, uh, and, and give covering a, a, a topic in, 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 in ex ex significant depth is the amount of, I think the best way to put it is counselling for review teams that we need to do. And in particular, the firm counselling of no, 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 don't go and do all of that qualitative literature. Um, and in particular, we've, you know, we've had some, we've got some enormous uh, reviews in this collection uh, with, a, with an, a huge amount of literature behind them and getting to the nub of the recommendations, because at the end of the day, uh, what we have been asked to do is to give effectively a set of global recommendations on what the best evidence looks like, together with our guidance on where policy and, and practitioners should be focusing. And that's a big challenge for both those that are commissioning us and for our review teams and the, and the, uh, the collaboration itself. So at this point, I'll turn to two reviews that are actually uh, published and out, uh, and, and, and critically so. Uh, and start with uh, Angela and the, and the and the Queensland team, uh, and then move on uh, to to Kiran. So, I'll, Angela, over to you. Okay, thank you, Peter. I just want to make sure that my screen is being shared there. Yes, I can see myself now. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. So today, basically, I'm going to be presenting results from two systematic reviews on the effectiveness of policing interventions specifically to reduce radicalization of violent extremism. Um, before I go too far, I would want to acknowledge my co-authors from University of Queensland, Lorraine Maserol, Adrian Cherney, Elizabeth Eggins, Lorelei Hine, and Emma Belton, who have done so much work on this project. Okay. So the two reviews I'm going to be speaking to are both published, as we said. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about our 2020 review that looks at policing programs that aim to reduce uh, violent extremist behaviour, attitudes or belief by increasing community connectiveness. 
Um, the next review I'll talk about then is our 2021 review on multi-agency programs where police have partnered with one or more other agency to reduce radicalization to violence. Now, although police are more typically framed as being responders to incidents of violence, in both of these two reviews, we've conceptualized the policing interventions as being preventive. So either being secondary prevention, so they target at-risk groups, or as tertiary prevention in that they focus on reducing reoffending or recidivism. Now, the first systematic review looked at police programs that seek to increase community connectiveness. Community engagement and connectiveness have been identified as being potentially quite mitigating the risk of people engaging in violent extremism. And there's a growing body of research that suggests that cohesive communities are resilient against a range of social harms, including violent extremist influences. We know more broadly from the general police literature that when police engage with the public in an inclusive and fair manner, that can increase the odds of them creating opportunities to improve community relations. So there are these wide range of benefits that are proposed from having strong police community relations. And these can include things from increasing the likelihood of police being in a position to identify individuals who are at risk of radicalization, or an increase in the likelihood that police are going to be able to successfully work with community leaders to counter the influence of violent extremist groups. I do want to clarify when we're talking about violent extremist groups um, or violent extremism in either of these reviews, we're talking about any group from the far right, far left, environmental extremists, political and religious extremist groups. We're not being um, particularly targeted. We're open to a very broad range. So for this review, it's been argued that police could work with community members to build trust, to reduce social isolation, to strengthen a sense of belonging by showing that police have got the interests of the community at heart and by those uh, efforts to increase community connectedness. This particular review then aimed at determining whether or not those police initiatives that are trying to foster community connectedness are also able to reduce violent extremism. Now, to be included in this systematic review, a study had to evaluate an intervention that had both a policing focus, so it had to involve police in some way, but it also had to aim to promote community connectedness. connectedness. For the purposes of this review, we're defining that as meaning that the intervention aimed to increase pro-social ties. So those ties can either be between the community members themselves or between the community members and police or between community members and other local community organisations. So within that, as you can imagine, we expect that police interventions that aim to promote this community connectedness are likely to overlap with a lot of more standard policing initiatives, things like community policing, neighbourhood policing, legitimacy approaches to policing. So essentially, we'd expect to see that eligible interventions are characterised by community consultation, by partnership, by collaborations within the community. Our search strategy, which I'm not going to go into in any detail whatsoever, was primarily focused on the use of the global policing database, but we also included a range of targeted hand searches, grey literature searches, reference harvesting, etc. The search and the search for all of our systematic reviews today has been quite specific to empirical studies. Um, and whenever we're talking about effectiveness, we're talking about studies that can provide robust causal evidence. So randomised control trials or strong quasi-experimental research using a comparison group. The initial search that we conducted after initial uh, title and abstract screening showed that we had a two, just uh, 2,273 documents to screen for this review. Unfortunately, after screening each and every one of the studies that we could locate, we actually only found one study that met our eligibility criteria of being the right kind of study evaluated in the right kind of way with the right kind of outcomes. That particular study was a quasi-experimental evaluation of the World Organization for Resource Development Education, or WORD, program, which is a US program it was evaluated in 2015. It was a program led by a group of Muslim scholars and community leaders who worked with experts in the areas of policy analysis, theology, academia, development. And this program had three interlocking components, and police were involved in two of them. So firstly, the program provided community education with a town hall meeting component that included uh, police there. Secondly, the program aimed to enhance the capacity of agencies, including law enforcement, 
to create a referral network that help the community identify and also help individuals who are at risk of becoming radicalised or at risk of committing violent offences. Thirdly, the program provided community members with the opportunity to participate in organised volunteerism or multicultural activities, things like art programs uh, around social change, work to assist the homeless. That particular component did not explicitly involve law enforcement. Um, in evaluating the program, um, the outcomes that we would find eligible, the closest were um, surveying participants, surveying volunteers on their levels of acceptance or engagement with cultural and religious differences or pluralistic views, things that could be considered measures of de-radicalisation under some definitions. This particular uh, set of outcomes had very small effects, very mixed effects, but it also really wasn't clear whether those volunteers who were evaluated were directly exposed to all three components of the intervention. So the evidence for a policing intervention, then we've got to say, is both limited and inconclusive, which is, of course, disappointing. But Whilst there was that really limited uh, effectiveness evidence, what we did find was a range of uh, other relevant interventions. Uh, specifically, we found 29 uh, very targeted, very relevant interventions, but none of which had been evaluated in a manner that we could say could make robust causal claims. So there's just some examples on the slide. We don't really have time to go through. But here are some interventions that we'd argue should be evaluated using designs that would allow us to draw those causal conclusions. Our second systematic review then looked at multi-agency programs where police were a partner and where the program aimed to reduce radicalisation to violence. Now, as you are aware, there is a great deal of heterogeneity in the risk factors and triggers for radicalisation, but the literature generally agrees that with such complex pathways, it's difficult, if not impossible, for any one agency to be responsible for addressing the problem alone. So as a result, and has been alluded to by uh, previous speakers, interventions are often characterised by multi-agency partnerships working across different service delivery sectors. So these multi-agencies in interventions can give us a framework to pool resources, to share resources, to address this common problem. They can be conceptualised on a continuum, with, from very minimal collaboration at one end through to really holistic integration at the other end. So this second review then had two aims. Partially, this is because we learned from our first review. Firstly, uh, the aim was to determine whether police multi-agency partnerships actually do reduce radicalisation to violence. But secondly, we're interested in what the underlying mechanisms, moderators, implementation and economic considerations were around these, uh, around these studies. So more simply, we're interested in what the facilitators and barriers to successful implementation were. Now, to be eligible for this review, an intervention had to involve police partnering with at least one other agency, and the intervention had to address terrorism, violent extremism, or radicalisation to violence. Those agencies uh, can be government agencies, local councils, but also businesses, communities, or service providers. So we were quite open in what kind of agencies. Once again, we used an extensive search strategy. This time we identified uh, just over 5,000 records being potentially about policing, terrorism, radicalisation, extremism to screen. And this time, once again, we found the same one impact evaluation as in the first review because there were partnership components. Fortunately, though, we had learned from our first review, and as a result, we were able to create a qualitative synthesis of these mechanisms, moderators, implementation, and economic considerations. There were 181 studies that we identified that talked about um, these kinds of programs and all of these factors around the programs. 26 of those uh, particular studies provided enough detail that we believed we could perform a robust qualitative synthesis on those uh, factors. So that particular synthesis is quite extensive. I do recommend having a read. Um, a selection, though, of our key findings about those factors that are important for successful implementation um, are listed here. So the research highlighted the importance of multi-agency teams taking time to build trust, to develop shared goals between partners, uh, not just to be mashed together um, in an opportunistic fashion. 
but also that police needed to be open and transparent when they engage with their community partners. They need to always ensure that they're acting in a way that prioritises the needs of the community in order to create the trust that allows a multi-agency or any policing intervention in this area to be successful at a community level. Uh, the research also recognised the bureaucratic burdens of working across multiple agencies and they noted that to be successful these multi-agency teams really oughtn't to be overburdened with excess admin. They're in, uh, the studies demonstrated that targeted and strong privacy provisions needed to be in place if we're going to be doing intelligent sharing um, because that's extremely important and finally um, well, not really finally, but finally of these these top key ones, the research noted the need for multi-agency teams to have ongoing support, ongoing funding, ongoing training, at least for the duration of the partnership, rather than simply initial training and then be left to their own devices. Now, lastly, I did say I was going to talk about two things, but I am actually just going to give a very brief nod to a piece of work that we're currently finalising. And this is with my colleagues, Michelle Sides, Lorelei Hine, Laura Duggan and Lorraine Mazarol. And we're creating an evidence and gap map of criminal justice interventions for preventing terrorism and radicalisation. So we've got two aims of this particular research. Firstly, we're aiming to identify all of the existing evidence that looks at the effectiveness of criminal justice interventions in this space, and we're hoping that we'll be able to use that to guide future systematic reviews and prevent this rather depressing problem of the empty review, where we know that the interventions are out there and they're existing, but nobody's yet evaluated them, so we end up with a review with one token study in it. Secondly, though, the evidence and gap map will identify gaps in the evidence where we would expect to see that there should be evidence and the, then we can identify that those gaps are where new primary research really does need to be undertaken. So that can help us identify, funders identify where future funding for primary research can best be applied. So this EGM is interested in interventions across the full criminal justice spectrum, so policing, courts and corrections, but again we'll focus on effectiveness evaluations. The final product, we estimate that that's going to be available at the end of the first quarter of next year, will include an interactive online evidence and gap map where you can filter according to a range of domains. To date, very happily, we have identified more than 100 eligible policing studies that have evidence of the standard that we're looking for, and we're nowhere near finished yet. We still have plenty more to come from policing, from courts, and from corrections. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. Angela, uh, that must be a global record for the most number of Campbell Systematic Reviews presented in 12 minutes. Uh, a great job. Uh, and crit critically, again, bringing out what's you know what's beginning to emerge from these uh, from the reviews. Which, when we first sat uh, to do this at a meeting in London, which seems like a very long time ago, uh, with Ajmal and uh, and colleagues, uh, the first thing we were worried about was empty reviews. Uh, I have to say that's not actually been our experience. They've ge there's generally been a considerable body of evidence, uh, and as you've heard from. The first presentation, some making sure that we draw from other disciplines as well as uh, specifically from uh, from the from literature with the terrorism label. So there's much to be done, uh, and so we're hoping to bring it together in in Stockholm. And I, I'm hoping that we'll get the evidence and gap map very publicly uh, pre presented uh, at the Stockholm Symposium because it's a great place to do it and bring the reviews together with uh, an overview of well, what do the big themes look like? Um, the aim of the evidence and gap map is to power uh, a second tranche of reviews, looking at the areas that we've not covered up to now and the questions uh, that are continuing to emerge for as, as practice and the challenges in the field uh, change. So that's that's where we're hoping to go. Uh, gives us the opportunity to have the second review that's uh, that's been completed, which is uh, uh, the uh, Kiran's uh, review, which I hope I hope we can now hear from. And then what I was going to do is uh, we've got the opportunity for uh, for live Q and A, and if we don't get questions, then we will we will pick up themes as a team uh, uh, on the on the review because this is being recorded with a view to us making sure we give an opportunity for a wider exposure of the of these reviews as we begin to get this evidence out in policy and public sphere. 
So I'll, I'll hand over to Karan. This should be on. Yeah, hopefully. thank you, Peter. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, and you can see my PowerPoint slide. Uh, I think I need to maximize it. I think when I maximize it now, you should. Um, yeah. Do you see it full screen? Is that correct? Uh, it's coming up. That's it. Okay, great. Thanks very much, everybody. And thanks, Peter, and to the previous speakers. Yeah, my name is Kieran Sarma, and together with my colleagues Sarah Carthy from Leiden and Katie Cox from Galway also, we set out to look at um, uh, the link between mental disorder, psychological problems, and terrorist behavior. And uh, again, thanks to our funders, Campbell Collaboration, who supported the review, um, Department of Homeland Security, and uh, the European Commission uh, provided some funding as well. It's part of a broader um, suite of studies that we're conducting in Galway, looking at what we're calling the mental health difficulties slash terrorism hypothesis, which is the suggestion that there is some kind of causal link between mental health difficulties and the risk of becoming involved in violent extremism. And um, we're, I suppose, looking at a specific body of literature for this systematic review, but we're also looking at other bodies of evidence to see do we find any kind of echoes um, of uh, some links there that, I suppose, provide substance to the kind of works that um, uh, Angela spoke about multi-agency working, often there are health workers involved in those teams. And uh, I suppose we're looking to see is there are the efforts justified when you look at the group based statistics, accepting that within the nuances of um, individual pathways into violent extremism, you may well find that mental health difficulties pose a problem or are, are, are part of the picture, should I say. But um, we're wondering, do you see that more broadly when you look at terrorist or samples of, of people who have been involved in violent extremism? So our review has been published and uh, I'm going to try in about seven minutes to give you a flavor for what we, um, the background to what we did, the rationale for it, what we actually did, what we found and what we think some of the implications are of our findings. Um, so I guess the, the background is that for the last approximately 50 years, there has been debate in the literature on the potential role of mental health difficulties in um, the process of becoming involved in violent extremism. And in the beginning, as we know, it probably started off with consideration of some of the major mental health disorders, including personality disorders, um, and uh, with lots of different formulations given as to how these different um, difficulties could uh, lead individuals to be susceptible to becoming involved in terrorism. And uh, what we have found is that, uh, okay, sorry, that my screen's about to go blank on me, so excuse me. What we have found is that, uh, okay, the assertions have been made and we're not so sure to what extent those assertions are supported by the evidence. So um, in particular, there is um, quite often individual studies cited in the literature that appear to show high rates of mental health difficulties or specifically diagnosed mental disorders in some samples. Um, though the findings are inconsistent, it raises the possibility of cherry picking of those studies that are reporting higher or potentially lower rates to support preconceived notions about this whole area. As I said already, it's part of the justification for the involvement of frontline workers in multi-agency teams. And I know from speaking with them, and I've, I've um, authored two papers on this for the Radicalization Awareness Network within the European Commission, um, where we worked with or spoke with multi-agency teams to see to what extent mental health difficulties um, arise and what their experiences has been um, in that area. And certainly there is a, um, a common voice out there where frontline practitioners view um, mental health difficulties as an important part of the picture um, in the individuals with whom they work. So um, all of that kind of lines up towards supporting the hypothesis, but we're not so sure about the evidence. And so that is what we are um, interested in. Now, we accept that there's lots of different bodies of evidence out there that could be synthesized. We can't synthesize them all. So what we did is we looked at um, a particular type of study um, or a group of studies that give us information on prevalence rates of mental health difficulties or diagnosed disorders within um, samples of individuals who've been involved in violent extremism. So we're, we're focusing on prevalence rates. And our rationale for doing that comes from the Bradford Hill criteria which um, uh, with the argument being that yeah, if there is a causal relationship between mental health difficulties and involvement in violent extremism, well, then we should see higher rates of mental health difficulties in those populations of people involved than you would expect to see in the general population. So that is the kind of um, rationale behind what we're trying to do. So our, our job really is to 
um, estimate the prevalence rates within those involved and compare it to some kind of a benchmark from um, epidemiological studies from the general population. And we looked at three types of data, I suppose. First of all, we looked at all these studies where you have, they report prevalence rates of mental health difficulties or mental disorders, or suspected disorders, or psychological problems, all these different terms that are used that I'll talk about in a minute. So we looked at those to see what the overall pooled estimates are across those studies. One of the limitations of that is that it's not always shoot clear where the onset of the difficulties that they're experiencing arise after their involvement during incarceration, for example, or as a result of difficulties of reintegrating in society afterwards. And so we then looked at a smaller subset of, of studies where they dealt with the issue of temporality. That is, they, were, they attempted to identify um, the proportion of individuals and the prevalence rates of, indi of individuals who, who develop psychological difficulties or disorder prior to their involvement in um, violent extremism. And that's our second objective, really, which is about temporality. And finally, we specifically sought out studies that compared um, uh, individuals who had been involved in, in violent extremism with another set of individuals not involved. So that's kind of where we were going with our rationale. I want to just make some comment on a core concept here. Um, I've been using the term mental disorder, suspected disorder, psychological difficulties, mental health difficulties, psychological problems, and that's kind of reflecting what's going on in the literature. But for the purposes of our review, what we did is we said a mental disorder is, arises when someone has been diagnosed, assessed and diagnosed by a trained mental health professional and or where they use a diagnostic tool that gives you an established screening uh, threshold where you can, in a valid way, say those above the threshold are likely to have a mental disorder. So we use the term mental disorder in that context. What we use the term mental health difficulties to, to describe the array of different other types of problems you see in the literature and which we often refer to as psychological problems. And these problems are problems that often arise normally in the course of our everyday lives. They may or may not require that we seek help for those um, psychological problems. So we're kind of making distinction there. And as I said, the, the, uh, the context is violent extremism. Um, we focus specifically on cross-sectional cohort and case control studies. And um, uh, to be included, uh, the participants in those studies had to have been involved in, um, in extremist behavior at some stage in the past and either the self-report they were involved or where we could draw and extract data from official sources, open sources, or a combination of any of these. Um, we had a wide uh, search syntax, as I'll show you in a moment, and uh, we were very lucky to have been supported in our search by um, Liz Higgins, who was a search specialist with um, Campbell Collaboration and was also involved in the Angela study um, uh, in the earlier presentation. We used Distiller SR, which is a software program to help us manage a screening process, which was required because we had 196,000 records that met our inclusion criteria. This is because of the, the, the wide um, range of different terms that are used to describe um, mental health difficulties. And uh, the, we use every DSM um, uh, uh, criteria in the, within the diagnostic system uh, just to make sure we went as wide as possible with an extensive gray literature um, search as well. So it, it required a, um, two two um, and times four of us screening full time for weeks to try and review all those records at title and abstract level before we ever got down to full text level, ending up with 56 reports. And it, within those reports, we had 73 individual studies or samples that met our inclusion criteria. So in terms of some data, as I said, our first objective was to examine the prevalence rates of mental health difficulties in, in their varying forms within uh, samples of individuals who've been involved in extremism. Now, we had to set some, some benchmarks, and this is kind of always a bit arbitrary in a way because there's so many studies out there, but we use Steele's um, meta-analyses of epidemiological studies reporting lifetime prevalence of diagnosed mental disorders in the community as our benchmark, which was 22.9% of the population that at some stage been diagnosed with a mental, health, mental disorder. Um, and in our pooled estimates of 18 studies, we reported 17.4% um, of, of individuals for within those studies of samples of individuals involved in violent extremism, they had diagnosed mental disorders. That well, increased to 23.2% when we set a more lenient um, uh, threshold and include studies where, bless me, 10 minutes up already, where we had um, uh, basically any study that reports suspected mental disorders was included, which was 
and eight samples, and we found that the, uh, the lifetime prevalence rate increased at 23.2%. Again, nothing obvious emerging there. Then we went down and we looked at um, rates of difficulty. So this is any, um, any difficulties at all, mental health, um, it could be psychological problems, it could be um, suspected disorder or disorder. And here we have um, a threshold of 50.7% from the British cohort study. Um, again, there are thousands and thousands of individuals in these um, studies that gave us our benchmarks. Um, so that's the lifetime rate of any psychological problem expected in the general population. And in our samples, um, in 21 studies, we found rates of 28.5% and um, for any problems and any difficulties, the problems is excluding those studies reporting diagnosed disorders. But when we included diagnosed disorders um, and suspected disorders and any other problems in 37 studies, we found that the rate was 25.5%. We did some moderator analysis. We compared studies that had closed, used closed sources, which is um, official data from police security services, for example. We compared that with open source studies that use open sources, like media coverage of, um, of trials. And we found the rate was as high as 39.1% when studies relied on closed source data and as low as 21.2% when they relied on uh, open source data. And we also found differences across different forms of terrorism or, or violent extremism, where we um, compared lone actor studies with all other studies, again, showing higher rates of, um, of uh, lifetime experiences of, of psychological difficulties amongst lone actors versus others. So that was for the first analysis looking at objective one prevalence rates. Then we looked at a refined set of studies where they could determine or they try to determine temporality. That is studies that reported prevalence rates of mental health difficulties where those difficulties were onset prior to involvement of violent extremism, giving us just five studies. And here the rate was 30% versus our benchmark of 50.7% from the British cohort study. So again, nothing remarkable emerging there. Now, finally, we, we identified a set of studies, five, that compared a um, sample of violent extremists with non-violent extremists. And in general, um, these studies tend to report, compare violent extremists with other offenders who have not been involved in violent extremism. And in four of those studies, we find no statistically significant difference in rates of mental health difficulties across the two samples, um, violent extremists versus other offenders. Um, there is one study that reports that violent extremists are more than three times more likely to have a, um, a mental health difficulty than non-extremist offenders. But we found, we suspect that this may be due to sampling issues. Um, there's two different data sets used and to be included in those data sets, there's different pathways and different requirements. And so we wondered if that might partially explain some of the findings. So some conclusions, I think I have two minutes left. Some conclusions. So, as I said, we've looked at a specific set of studies um, that have taken a specific methodology to examine this area, and we've used um, benchmarks that we think are widely accepted within the, um, within the mental health um, sectors. And what we've found is the existing rates of mental health difficulties reported in the body of evidence is largely unremarkable relative to those benchmarks. So we don't find a lot of evidence, we don't really find any evidence at all for the, um, for the mental health um, violent extremism hypothesis, as I described it earlier. You would anticipate if there's a causal link between mental health difficulties and terrorist involvement, um, that you would uh, see higher rates or at least um, equal rates to that um, expected in the general population. We did find some differences across different forms of terrorism and we would highly highlight that um, in particular lone actors appear to have higher rates than other extremists, which is kind of in line with the literature that has emerged um, and, and also formulations for why lone actors become involved in violent extreme, extremism. In terms of implications, well, three that I want to discuss here, we've a lengthy uh, section in our paper that um, looks at broader implications, but we think one of the important ones is the disaggregation of different forms of terrorism. We think that the idea of collapsing them all into one, one um, phenomenon is not really going to give us anything useful in this area. And we need to start looking at different forms and look at, um, at what is going on in terms of trajectories into those different forms of violent extremism. Um, we think that we need to move beyond um, consideration of a mental health difficulty as a direct causal link with um, involvement. 
And we think that uh, there's probably alternative hypotheses out there that should be considered, one of which is uh, casting a more positive psychology lens on this whole area. And rather than suggesting that there's a link between mental health difficulties and involvement, we might consider how resilience or a lack thereof, more, which is part of which might be mental health difficulties, but it's a much broader concept. And um, something like resilience might give us a better explanatory value in this area. And that is me um, in 12 minutes. Thank you very much. Kiran, thanks. That was that was great. And and critically, that kind of major point that's come out of that review, which is if you're looking for strategies uh, for preventing terrorism radicalization, it's the, the starting point should not be a focus on mental health. Is I think the kind of overwhelming policy issue that's coming out of that. There are uh, one of the presentations that would have that we did last week, uh, well, I say we did, Isabella Zeich did last week, is on the, fam the family factors. Um, and it, it, in, in contrast to, the, to, me to mental health, the family factors pro provide a, a very strong place to start uh, and some very compelling evidence about the kind of interventions and, and approaches that might work, even though not all of them have yet been tested. So I, I encourage people to read that. It is an omnibus uh, review by Isabella um and and a, and you know was brilliantly presented last week at the, at the seminar at uh, cambridge we've got three questions but with, which uh, two of which by the way are the editor-in-chief taking advantage of her ability to answer ask very complicated methods questions um I, i'm just and there's one on um on right-wing extremism but just before we go to those i just wanted to to take advantage of this moment because we've got a program in flight um, I'm going to share uh, my screen, uh, which I hope I can do, and in that process, share the share the reviews that are in that have, are in flight. So, so just to just to just to show that we've got these are the reviews that are on the screen. I hope that everyone can see those that are on that are published. So there's a very considerable body of published reviews, and I commend all of them to those that are interested in this area uh, and particularly those involved in policy. Uh, we're also in the process of producing uh, what, what um, our DHS colleagues call a trifold for each one, which is basically a, a key summary of the points that will allow a, a, the, the, the review to actually resonate in both policy and practice terms. Uh, we have these are the in-flight systematic reviews and you've heard from two of those uh, today, uh, and we, we're well advanced on almost all of those, including the evidence and gap map. Um, and just to, to finish the picture with the three reviews that we're in the process of identifying teams, uh, we have teams for one and four, and we're in on those. We have, uh, we've got uh, re reviews two and three on violent, violent extremist actors' use of language on social media human trafficking and radicalization to violence. I may have a team for number three, but, uh, but I'm interested in having uh, volunteers come forward to suggest they might be able to do either of the two, of number two or three, uh, because we want to get those reviews uh, started as, uh, as, as fast as possible. Uh, and we're effectively doing all for those, uh, both of those two. So just to highlight, we're in progress and hoping as well to use the evidence and gap map to uh, to map forward uh, a, a further uh, set of programs linked to where we've got evidence and where questions deserve to be answered. Uh, and that takes us into uh, Kate, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, I'm sure, Nihan's question, uh, which is that I've read that law enforcement in my country has paid insufficient attention to right wing extremism. Uh, if that's also the case for funders and for agencies who, whose cooperation researchers need to conduct evaluations, then the primary literature on terrorism prevention may have some important gaps. Well, that's part of doing the evidence and gap map. Can you comment on whether such gaps exist and how evidence synthesis authors can handle potential evidence gaps? Um, I, Angela, for the evidence and gap map team, that's probably that's probably a question for, for the team. And it's part of what it's about is identifying uh, gaps. Uh, but I'd also say from the point of view of the funders, we've had, we, you know, we, we try to respond to the questions that are 
right on the top of the agenda and we we have had obviously the thread on uh on right-wing extremism we're not we, we have we take no particular stance on what sort of terrorism we're looking at terrorism across the piece angela do you want to comment on the from the evidence and gap map point of view um yeah look from the evidence and gap map point of view and also from most of the systematic reviews that either i've been involved in or as an editor on um authors are usually or reviewers are very keen to differentiate to be able to see if the results differ according to the type of um of terrorism or of ex, you know of violent extremism that they might see so uh, certainly within reviews if there is enough evidence to be able to do so you do want to be able to look and see if there's if there's a difference across the different types um, for the gap map i can't say at this point whether or not there is a gap there um, but it is certainly something that is one of our filterable fields so that we'll be able to see um if sort of ideology comes into play when it um we'd be able to answer your question better by in a couple of months time but it is a very important question may, may i add a point of course um so to your to to date uh, uh we bit prior to campbell collaboration cpn we just published actually two systematic reviews on primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention programs in the uh, CVE space. And uh, that does show us actually, particularly in primary, but as well as in tertiary, that there is a major gap in uh, programs addressing violent right wing. I mean, the big umbrella, because violent right wing extremism is, is such a big umbrella and includes so many things. But there currently is an important gap in terms of uh, programming evaluations for this type, for these types of violent extremism. Fortunately, a lot of uh, evaluation studies and programmings are rising. So in the next, I think, in the past year and in the next couple of years, we will have uh, significantly more data. But uh, I, to your point, there is a gap there, definitely. Okay, so we have two minutes more remaining of the uh, of the process. We've got uh, Vivian. You've asked two amazingly complicated questions, uh, but which I can boil down to, um, which, because there's the, 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 there's two arms to it. One of which is about handling qualitative evidence, um, and the second one is uh, is about the uh, encouraging the learning system across the entire program of research. And I think you know, that's one of the purposes of seeking to bring together as many of the uh, review teams as possible um, in Stockholm in June, uh, partly because we actually want to get, uh, uh, unfortunately the government in Sweden uh, changed because the previous prime minister was keen to chair a session bring things together and I'm hoping we can persuade the new one to do to do likewise because actually there's a big, there is a, um, there is, there is a political uh, piece to this which is about uh, politicians both uh, owning some of the findings of this of this work, a lot of which is about the complexity and the care with which both words, uh, because the, Kiran, you were involved in an earlier review about words and counter radicalization narratives, about the ways in which politicians learn how to frame approaches in which uh, their uh, you know, the, 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 the political life doesn't add to the, the problem but also has the ability to uh, frame approaches which might reduce the problem. Uh, but also for politicians to own the process of using the evidence uh, to target interventions that do the least, the least harm and the greatest good in this space. Uh, I think it's easy to do harm, much less, much less good to, uh, to, to, to do benefit. And a final piece is to pay tribute to the 5RD for sponsoring this and hopefully continuing to sponsor it as we go forward. Uh, I'm very, I'm very, very grateful to them for giving us the opportunity as a collaboration uh, to contribute to this to this important work. Uh, and I'll finish with a call. Uh, we, we'll be sending out a call for the stock for, for papers for Stockholm uh, in the kind of usual way we do in academic terms. We will definitely be sending it to all of those who are involved in doing the reviews. Uh, but we want we we have agreement from the, the Swedish Council for Crime Prevention that. These, this work on preventing terrorism and radicalization will be one of the major themes at the symposium. Uh, Sweden's a great place to go to in the summer, I appreciate. Uh, but actually it's an opportunity to share as teams and to get some of the cross-section messages that Vivian's talking about 
both in terms of the methods of how we do our research and the lessons that we've learned from it and get those out so that this research really does count in this field. And for that, on that basis, I'm going to thank the presenters for doing a fantastic job in, in a very short space of time. Uh, I can't think of, I've, I've chaired many sessions in which so many reviews have been uh, presented in such a short space of time. And I thank you very much. Hopefully the, there'll be a lot of people who both watch, have watched the live session, but above all, will watch the recorded session. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.